Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a yeah, bizarrely humid free Florida Thursday morning. I don't know if it's because of all the storms we've had blow through, uh, what the weather's up to, but for the moment, I have to say, uh, it is unusually free from the sort of moist and permeating humidity that invades the air and you have to walk through. You can almost feel it. You can sort of put your arm out and move the humidity aside. It's just usually that bad in June and July and August here. And uh, that's what we're living through right now. And that's part of what makes me absolutely miserable this time of year. I'm just miserable. I mean, I snap at people. I, uh, you know, get bitchy with uh, waitresses at the restaurant and uh, people on the street. I'm inclined towards road rage, uh, even in the air conditioning, because I know what's going to happen when I open the door. So uh, this is just an absolutely shitty time of year. And for whatever reason, this morning is a very welcome reprieve from that. Uh, for the first time in, in a while, I've done done photos on this car. Uh, it's not really an auto house. Well, we'll get into it. But I've done them, and I'm not dripping. My my shirt, and not, it doesn't look like I've jumped in a swimming pool uh, and uh, am walking around. So that's a good thing. Uh, the birds have been going absolutely ape shit. They've been uh, they've been kind of uh, there's been bad focus. They've been in that tree over there. Scree there's one right there, uh, screaming at each other harshly, viciously, and uh, hopefully they'll take out their animosity on each other and not on me. They definitely seem to be uh, pissed off with whatever's going on. So hopefully they just stay that way. And we're going to get right into this thing. We're going to leap into it uh, because this is going to be a rather quick take on uh, this particular car and. Uh, on whether or not it makes a good used car. So uh, it's not really by design. I'm helping a friend of mine sell this thing. It may go up at Auto House just for the hell of it, but it's not really an Auto House car. Uh, it's a, a good friend of mine. Uh, I won't name names. Yeah. Andrew, any I think, look at that right there. Why isn't it focusing? He's right there. Look at him, he's picking at something down there, pretending to be interested in what's at the ground instead of what instead of my head. Anyway, um, uh, Andrew owns a European repair shop, and uh, as such, you would think this is a good car for Andrew to drive. Well, it turns out, no. Uh, he explained to me that it brakes faster than he can fix it. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a guy who is used to driving 12 cylinder cars and exotic cars. He has an Alfa Romeo he leases, and he says this Audi A8 is too much. So that should start to give a clue uh, to what I'm going to say about this thing. Uh, but anyway, this is a 2008 Audi A8 L, uh, the L standard for long wheelbase. It's a distant descendant of the Audi 5000, which you may remember was the um, uh, the one in the 80s and early, the one with the unintended acceleration, you know. Uh, it was a big 60 minutes feature. Uh, they, for a little while, journalists were claiming I mean, that you just hop in the car, turn it on, uh, you could have your foot mashed on the brake and somehow the engine would overcome the brake or the brake would release and you'd end up smushing your toddler against a garage door. Well, you know, obviously cars don't suffer multiple simultaneous failures of both the brake system and the acceleration system. And what was truly happening uh, was people were mashing the gas pedal when they thought they were on the brakes. And that's the way it all went down. Uh, people argued that the gas pedal was too close to the, but whatever. It just, you know, it was user error uh, that may or may not have been helped by um, uh, an iffy design. And it almost killed Audi in the United States. Absolutely almost murdered them. I mean, people were terrified of them. Uh, they became the, you know, the dark horse of the car world. Uh, and uh, guys who, you know, figured they could drive them responsibly ended up getting bargains and uh, 60 minutes minutes, of course, did its hit job on Audi and then went on later to do other hit jobs on GM and other companies. But uh, very briefly, let's just get into this and say, so here's the question post. You take a car like this. This is a 2008 Audi A8L. Uh, this one happens to have unusually prolific options. I mean, it's absolutely loaded. This thing probably stickered at about a hundred grand, which would have been, it would have been a lot for an A8. Uh, you get into the 12 cylinders they offered, it would have been over that right off the bat. But the A8s were generally less expensive than the, um, 
uh, comparable BMW 7 Series and the Mercedes S Series. They, they represented a little bit of a bargain in the Q-ship German big sedan world uh, until you started getting into all the options would raise the price. So now, here it is, like 13 years later, the car has 80-some thousand miles, which ain't bad, and it's cheap. I mean, it's a cheap, cheap car to buy. It's less than 10% of its original price. And that becomes very attractive to some people. I mean, let's say you're a young kid just getting started out or a young professional starting to make a little bit of money. You got some cash set aside. Uh, you're a drug dealer somewhere in a big city. You know, you're living in your mom's basement, but you got wads of $100 bills. Uh, or maybe you're an older guy on a budget, you know, with a retire, you know, you retired from the police force at 42 with full pension. And then so you want to know, should I buy a car like this? Because it's obviously an incredible car. Will I enjoy it? Will it be easy to own? Will it be easy to maintain? Uh, the straight up answer, and if you want to end the video right now, is no. Get the uh, run, run at top friggin' speed immediately. You know, go get that camera you've been eyeing. Uh, but we'll get a little bit more into that if you hang around. So uh, this is a D3 body for Audi. And listen to that thing. Listen to it. It's pissed off. And here's where we're going to get into stuff that I really dislike about the car world. Uh, the D3 body shares many, many components with the D1 body from Volkswagen Group. I'm not talking about Volkswagen cars, the whole group, everything, uh, which of course encompasses many, many different car brands. And the D3, it, it was used on the Bentley, uh, the uh, Flying Spur, it was used on the Volkswagen Phaeton. The D3, I'm sorry, the D1 was. The uh, the Bentley, the Phaeton, uh, the Porsche Panamera, and uh, to some extent this uh, Audi A8L uh, as well. Uh, and this is the thing that I absolutely despise about modern cars. Um, <sighs> You take those four companies, okay? You take Volkswagen, Porsche, Bentley, and Audi, and historically they have made radically different cars with their own personalities. No question about it. Uh, I mean, nothing unlike about them. Uh, you know, I know that, look, even when they were under the same ownership umbrella, I know like the 914 and the 924 had a lot of Audi components, but, uh, you know, they decided to make them Porsches, and they were specifically Porsches. Specifically, there was no Audi then that compared with them. Not true so anymore. I mean, you get in a Panamera, a Bentley, this A8, or a Volkswagen Phaeton, and yeah, you know, the sheet metal is different, the interior is different, but it's all only skin deep. Uh, what's underneath it all is essentially the same, and that's the thing that just drives me nuts. Cars have just absolutely lost their character. <sighs> anyway, what are you going to do? So... Here it is. So 13 years later, this car's cheap. It's amazing uh, in terms of the way it looks. I mean, look at this thing. I mean, sinister as hell. You pull up somewhere in this thing with the black windows and the 20-inch wheels. And, uh, you know, there's going to be Uzis inside and little bags of cocaine. And you might do a drive-by. It's just a, uh, you could also be some sort of European arch criminal who's going to have a, a little toolkit with him to electronically break into a bank and then go on a high-speed chase with someone behind him. I mean, it's just that kind of a car. That's the way it looks. So the temptation is there. But the... How to get into this? All right, so the A8 competes with the uh, Mercedes-Benz S-Class and the BMW 7 Series. And those companies have an ongoing rivalry with each other. And this A8, this second generation, uh, was designed to make up for the way that the first generation just wasn't doing the job. I mean, uh, the S-Class and the 7 had it all over uh, the A8 all through the, uh, you know, the 80s and the 90s, so, you know, whatever passed for an A8 in the 80s. And Audi was just in third place. It was a distant cousin to anything that worked. And they said, you know, the hell with that. We are going to make this thing compete. They loaded it up with you know, sort of incredible technology uh, to take it to a BMW and Mercedes. All of that is fantastic when the car is new and under warranty. But as these cars age, as they get older, as they get miles, as they get out of warranty, uh, and as they get cheap on the used car market, uh, what's worth remembering is that even if you can buy this thing for, you know, anywhere from nine to fourteen grand, 
you're not maintaining the car you bought used. You're maintaining the car that was new. You're maintaining this $100,000 exotic German luxury Q ship uh, with all of the stuff that uh, is in it. And that's, you know, that's what you got to remember. So um, it's, uh, it's definitely worth doing a little bit of investigation when you're buying one of these. Uh, they have shitloads of uh, complicated features. For instance, this thing, it does use the 4.2 liter V8, which is considered to be fairly bulletproof. I mean, you do get um, you do get some leak issues, your valve covers, your rear main seal, that kind of thing. I have read about where they have carbon buildup sometime in the intake and runners, and then that's a pain to deal with. Uh, but for the most part, and uh, not unlike the uh, Mercedes V8s, they're pretty damn bulletproof. BMW V8s are different. BMWs shit at building V8s, or at least they have been historically. Uh, they made a terrific six-cylinder, but uh, when it came to eight cylinders, eh, I don't know. I just don't think they could pull it off very well. <clears throat> but uh, so the engine is not your big issue. But then that goes into a six-speed transmission, uh, probably built by ZF, but yeah, whoever. And it has 200 different programming facets where it's going to detect the way that you drive and run the appropriate program. So, uh, you know, if you're some kind of psycho lead foot and you get in this thing, you're hammering it everywhere. You're on the gas, you're on the throttle, you're heavy on the brakes, you're on the, you're racing. It's going to find that subroutine that matches the way you drive and it's going to react accordingly. If you're Mr. Magoo or some old lady who's barely pressing the throttle all the time, it'll find that subroutine. Well, I mean, who's to say? that's not going to get screwed up at some point and it's going to go into the Mr. Magoo subroutine when you're Michael Schumacher or vice versa so uh, you know it just this is the kind of crap that scares me the whole car uses a, a CAN bus a most bus system with a bunch of different little computers that all communicate with each other run through various parts of the car and uh, decide what the best thing is going to be and you know I don't know how the hell does the uh, average you know shade tree mechanic even begin to think about fixing that I mean you can barely change your own oil in the damn thing are you going to be really programming the CAN bus system I mean you're not even going to be able to have the computers to work on this thing. They're all, you know, Audi dealership technology that costs a shitload to have. So uh, doing your own mechanical work, eh, probably not something that's going to happen very easily. Uh, like the Bentley, this car also has an adaptive suspension uh, called the Skyhook, or at least that's the... Uh, the true version of it. And what that essentially means is it senses the road uh, ahead and makes corrections based on what's coming up. So if it's dipping the right front, it can do it very quickly, independent of the other wheels. When you're on the Autobahn at high speeds, it's going to lower the whole car uh, to make it more aerodynamic. When you're driving around town, it's going to raise the car. You know, I'm sure that's real easy to maintain, and I'm sure that's going to keep working as time moves on. There's going to be no issue with this vastly computer-controlled uh, air suspension system. I wouldn't worry about that at all. It shouldn't even trouble you that when you look underneath a Bentley flying spur uh, from the same era, you're going to see Audi rings on all the parts, you know. So uh, just remember, when you buy your ten grand Audi A8, you're going to be maintaining a Bentley. Chew on that a little bit. Uh, even the headlights are big adaptive, scary. Uh, there was a name for them, even FSL or something, uh, where they uh, adapt to the road ahead. They level themselves. Uh, the bulbs are like 300 bucks to put in. Uh, yeah, gee, you know, you can't just go to Advanced Auto Parts and buy a sealed beam. That's over. Uh, this thing has some weird German license plate, Ubuntu. It's like some geeky programming language from Linux that my little Polish cousin would love. So I don't know who owned this thing. But anyway, 20-inch uh, wheels, which were optional on this A8. This particular one is a shitload of options. And uh, some kind of Firestone Firehawk Indies on them. So the guy who drove this was fairly sporty. Um... I tell you what, let me pause for a minute and we're just going to dive right into this car.
All right, so I have to remember that this one's going to be kind of a short take and not go. We're not even going to get into the history of Audi and all that stuff. We'll save that for another time. Uh, from the back, you can see uh, you got a couple of twice pipes there. You got uh, rear parking sensors. I, I don't know if they're standard on the A8 L or not, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, you've got uh, these taillights, and it's another good indication of what I'm talking about. By 08, the taillights, all the lights on the car had become LED, uh, which is fantastic, and it looks cool at night, and it's great. Uh, but, you know, gone are the days when you could go to Advance Auto and buy your 1157 and stick it in. I mean, when these things screw up, you're looking at replacing the entire assembly or, you know, having some crafty mechanic take it apart to do soldering and demoisturizing or whatever else. Uh, with the uh, cool LED lights come extra maintenance to keep them going. Uh, here's another thing I'm talking about. So I pinched the little opener. It actually worked. Okay, I take that back. Uh, early, oh, look at that. I left the toolkit out. This is the flag. You may need this. This is what you use on the highway when you're stalled and you pull uh, the cap off. Inside is a little warning triangle that um, will let other cars know that you're... Your Audi is uh, <laughs> its not going to be continuing. Uh, but anyway, that worked. Earlier on, I had to help the trunk lift up. Now it seems to be working on its own. Uh, you see it has these ridiculous-looking hinges here with these big struts. And uh, anyway, okay, I give it credit. It's still working. That was going to be one of my examples of a broken part, but eh, it corrected me. Uh, there you see the little square box in the back. That's the refrigerator. We'll get into that. In a minute, you got some floor mats and a uh, little false floor in the trunk. Man, there's your spare tire, which is remarkable that it has one inside there. Who knows? One of the computer systems or the jacking, I guess that's the jacking stuff, uh, which you can have. You have these little tie downs, so if you stuff a toddler in the back, you can strap him down, he won't go flying around. Uh, these little pull handles here, I like these. These are also on Mercedes. Uh, you can use these things to hang your plastic shopping bags from so they don't go flying around the trunk and uh, that does matter on this car where the uh, trunk is that far forward uh, from my angle here it does almost look like the seats fall down uh, but I really don't think they do so anyway we'll get into that nice big trunk befitting of a German luxury car of this size and uh, for the moment it all seems to be working fine so we press that down it comes now when those struts were out it's gonna come down like a guillotine and chop off any body part that you may have too close. Let's have a look under the hood. Andrew also had this detailed crappily, so it looks like crap under here. Uh, but anyway, there you see this sort of overcomplicated overhead cam 4.2 liter V8 that has variable valve timing and has a missing Audi emblem. Lovely. Who knows why that flew off. Um, and, uh, you know, but for the most part, does seem to be a fairly reliable engine, other than I hear they have some thermostat issues that sometimes those things get blocked, a car can overheat. Uh, of course, you'll be dealing with oil leaks, valve cover gaskets, pan gaskets, front timing chain shit, that kind of thing. And uh, all of that can get awfully expensive uh, if you have bad luck. So uh, if you're a lucky guy, if, um, you know, that kid in Miami who's slinging the drugs and making money, you're, you know, feeling like everything's going your way, then this might work out for you. Uh, otherwise, you could end up with engine issues on top of all the other crap you're going to have to deal with. Uh, for instance, this is a Quattro, which, you know, Audi's Quattro system is pretty reliable, uh, but it does have front and rear limited slip differentials that are computer controlled, connected to the other driving systems of the car, and uh, can definitely cause you some misery if those start going south. I don't like the door handles on this car. Uh, they're pull up from the bottom things. And, you know, Mercedes and I believe BMW, but certainly Mercedes, you just, from the top, you can put your whole hand in them and pull. These things you gotta get underneath and man, they slip. I just don't like them as much. Uh, the A8L adds a few inches to the wheelbase of the car, uh, but only truly for rear seat passengers. Uh, they get all this space. Uh, the normal A8 already had a lot of space, so it really, 
you know, if you're just driving the thing, it doesn't matter that much. It's just an extra letter on the back, uh, which may or may not be important to you. Uh, but anyway, you're going to be pretty good. Canadians are going to be chipper as hell back there. I mean, they've got endless leg room. They've got pretty comfortable uh, heated leather seats with piping and all that. It's quite nice. Uh, they've got their own climate control system, their own lighter. Uh, they've got these weird little map pockets, which are bizarre. I can't even begin to imagine what you... I mean, you're never getting a gun in there. Uh, anything you do put in there is going to be smushed. I mean, this is just specifically maybe for file folders or something. Uh, so that is not going to help you at all if you're that um, that kid in Miami. Uh, there you see it as a back uh, sunscreen. That's power. That's going to break at some point. Uh, it's got manual side sunscreens, which Audi will probably figure out a way to make break. Uh, you do have these uh, little cocaine mirrors in the top, which I'm having trouble deploying. There we go. Yeah. So you got those. You got a little overhead console there. You've got this rather gorgeous optional Alcantara headliner, which probably looks like shit with the camera, but looks quite nice when you're in the car. And uh, again, oodles and oodles of legroom. Uh, this kind of shit, it shares with the Bentley and the Phaeton. Uh, it has a computer-controlled, moisture-sensing window fog system that, uh, you know, purportedly will never let the windows fog up under any conditions. Yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, center console, you can pull this thing down already. It looks like the latch is not cooperating. Yeah, I don't feel latchy. Here's your uh, refrigerator temperature control. And you open that up, and there is a really nice spot for your little bags of Coke or your water bottles or uh, your blood samples, whatever it is you need to drive around with. Uh, you're going to be able to uh, put in there and keep cool, assuming that it's still working for the moment. Uh, there you see the Bang & Olufsen subwoofer with that big uh, aluminum thing in the center with two little full range on either side. Uh, this is a $6,300, 1,000-watt, 14-speaker sound system uh, that somebody opted for in this car. And, uh, you know, God bless them. There's also a million different varieties of wood. Uh, this one has this sort of inlay in it, these weird little pattern uh, that makes it look to be like something you'd have in the Old West. You know, it's got a saloon feel to it. Um, I think I would like it better without the weird pattern, but I suppose that does make it something different from other big cars. You do have a nice little spot here. You're not really going to fit a gun in there, but you get all kinds of bags of drugs, more of the Bang & Olufsen speakers, and uh, here is a pretty good spot for uh, some sort of small 9mm and uh, obviously any parts that just kind of fall off the car. Uh, you can stick them in there and they're going to be nice and safe. I don't think these things have self-closed doors. Uh, they do have keyless, so you can press that to lock it. You can press this to lock it. No, no, apparently you can't. Maybe you just press it to open it. I've got the key here. Let's see if this is another system that's broken in this car. And see, so here's our key. All right, the car's locked. I presume that's what that beep meant. So let's see if I go to open it. Okay, locked, not letting me in. Press the button. Nothing. Press this button. Wait a minute. Okay, so it's locked. Is it still locked up here? No. Okay, so that did work. Where did it work? From the front or the rear? Let's try that again. All right, we are locked. All right, I'm pulling. Okay, it did open. All right, you know what? Okay, well, for the moment, that does still seem to be working. This car is thwarting me on the terror I'm trying to convey to you. Uh, here you see another very nicely finished door panel. Little aluminum things poking out a little, probably because he had to fix something. Um, yeah, you got your memory seats, your, I don't know what the hell this red button is for. It'll turn it on or off, something. I don't even want to touch it. It scares me. Trunk release, gas release. Nice little spot to put masks that thank God we don't need anymore and maybe a, a dry cleaning ticket. Uh, your window controls, it's got Audi exclusive badges here, which I think it's just trying to say airbag and more Audi exclusive badges on the side. So I presume that's part of the 
um, uh, the fancy interior package that this has. Uh, okay, real quick, before I get going, I got to put my crap in the back and hang the tag on the rear. Uh, then we're going to hop in and go for a drive. All right, tag is on. Let's do this. See those big rotors back there, all very nice. All right, so close the door. Get our seatbelt on. At least all that's fairly normal. And uh, because it has all this keyless stuff, we could just fire it up with um, this engine start button. And there you see the MMI screen coming up. We'll get into all that. Okay, the uh, gasket, it looks like we're getting pretty low. That's probably something you should get used to. I don't think these things have great uh, fuel mileage. I do think they're better than the... Um, uh, why is that set so high? I do think they're better than the S and the 7 of the same year, but uh, that really doesn't mean you're going to enjoy putting fuel in it. Alright, there's our air conditioning going. No, I don't want that to grease. You see this? Audi controls just bug the shit out of me. But anyway, we'll just get into it. So here's this fancy looking wood and leather steering wheel. It's got some controls here. This is probably voice command button inactive. Wonderful. Uh, volume control. This will change uh, radio stations for you. It's still got satellite, which I'm enjoying. And uh, the mode will change uh, your trip computer stuff. You've got these nice set in gauges, which I have to admit are pretty simple. Uh, your tack on the left, your uh, temperature control, temperature control, your temperature gauge, your uh, automatic headlights down here, you just leave on auto. Uh, this, it, not everybody knows this, all right? So I'm gonna do this real quick. This is like a Mercedes. So if you're zero, you got nothing. Auto, you got automatic lights. Uh, that's parking lights, that's full on, you know, headlights. Now, if you pull once, you've got the front fog lights. And a lot of guys like running around with that for looks. You pull twice, you get a rear fog light, uh, which on most German cars is just one side. It's like a single side brake light, a very light, uh, uh, bright light in the back. Don't do that if you're trying to rock your fog lights. You just need the one pole, not the two. Uh, you got your mirrors over here. I found that uh, this knob somehow is off center, so it's very difficult for me to get the downward. You see, it's kind of angled back uh, up and to the sides, pretty easy. Going down, you have to kind of wiggle it and find a little spot. In fact, I'm not even finding it now, so I don't know. There's something else that's broken. Uh, the windows all work, I believe. Here you have little kids. This is the ejection seat for children in the back. Um, again, very nice, you know, leather up here wrapped around, stitching. You know, all very nice materials. This sort of, um, you know, if you don't like the Audi grill, which I don't, it became this big, giant front grill in uh, 08, uh, maybe a little earlier. Uh, they replicated on the steering wheel to kind of give you the finger for people who don't like it. This is the Audi grill here. I think it looks silly. And the uh, Audi, uh, of course, the logo, which represent Auto Union. Uh, yeah, we'll get into that some other day. Uh, anyway, there's your fuel gauge. You've got your vents. Uh, one thing to ponder is all this crap is also in the Volkswagen Phaeton and the Bentley. And the uh, maintenance is going to be as such. Uh, like, I'm finding when I'm... <sighs> this is the stuff I hate about Audi. So here's the MMI which uses a most, not, not M O S T lowercase, all uppercase M O S T forgot what it stands for a uh, bus system, which has like uh, 20 microprocessor computers that are all connected with plastic microfiber to run through the MMI and do crap. And I'm sure that's all going to be very cheap. Uh, but anyway, I can press this on the MMI screen. You can now change the vent direction. Uh, it doesn't really seem to be working for me very well uh, because I'm still getting stuff up top and stuff out the bottom and uh, who knows. Uh, this here, that'll turn off your parking sensors if you're in a Dunkin' Donuts drive through and it's going off and driving you nuts. Uh, this will run the uh, back uh, sunscreen. Yeah, that sounds very... Um... <laughs> That sounds like it's gonna last, but anyway, it's working for now. Uh, electronic stability protection, that's the traction control. Uh, you can turn that off. You get the little logo saying you don't have traction control. I don't believe it for a minute. Uh, this car is just way too um, complex to not want to use that. I mean, it's not gonna let you go out and do four-wheel burnouts or anything. It's it's gonna come back on the minute it senses shit is going awry. Uh, this will lower this little fancy screen. I think this was the final straw 
for him when this thing broke. He had just had it in the shop. He fixed a bunch of shit on it. He fires the car up, and this thing comes up and, like, fizzles halfway and then cocks. <laughs> you know what? This is just too much. But anyway, he fixed it, and uh, I think now he just wants out. Uh, this is a weird little drawer for, I mean, what are you going to put in this fragile and sickly little thing? I mean, maybe a tiny bag of cocaine, uh, maybe some coins if you needed them or something. Uh, I have no idea what is the purpose of this. At first, I thought it was a cup holder, but um, what you put in there, I just don't know. I'm sure people come up with their own solutions. Uh, they do have a, a pretty standard climate control. At least they're not running that through the stupid MMI screen. Uh, the thing that I don't like about it is you've got one screen for different functions. So if you want to control the vents, you have to press this. Now it goes to the vent control. If you want to control the fan, you go to that button. Now it's showing you what the fan speed is. And if you want to go to the heated seats, hit that, and now it's showing you the heated seat setting. Uh, to me, that's just not intuitive. I don't like it, and it pisses me off. Uh, under here, if we could get this open, uh, yeah, it's not really an ashtray, so I guess this is the beginning of the time when Germans stopped smoking, and that's behind a fridge, a little panel that's sure to break in no time. Uh, you also have a real wood shifter with a nifty little side button. Uh, you can go over to drive, over to uh, manual and sort of bang your way through the gears like that and who the hell cares and why bother. Uh, it has an electronic parking brake which is much more complex than a standard parking brake and is sure to brake at some point. Uh, here's another thing that pisses me off about this Audi. You've got engine start, this big button here, and then a totally different end, uh, engine stop is above it. I want one one button for both, not not one each. I pressed this like nine times last night when I got home, not realizing there was a separate uh, control there to turn it off. Uh, your volume control is here, which is weird, instead of here, which is where you want it. But I'll give them some credit for at least giving you a, uh, a manual volume control. Yeah, we're all bad. Um, Okay, and here again is the same shit. All right, so here's the MMI. You see on the corners we have memory, nav, map, and root. Uh, that's gonna be controlled by these. So you press this, now we're into memory. You press this. Navigation is not active. <sighs> now we've got a little naggy, bitchy woman telling me it's not active. You press this, we're gonna have the map, and you press this, and uh, that's our route. Root. I've never really known how to pronounce that. But anyway, this is the thing that, and it's the same thing over here where you go into the AM, FM, now you've got presets tuning. And so you've got, this is where technology, in their, in their effort to make everybody wowed, they've made it complex and burdensome. So, I mean, okay, so CD, now you've got more. So you have to press this, then you have to press this, then you can turn the knob, or you have to press this. We get into car and setup. Uh, adaptive air suspension, you can change it as four different settings. We can lift it up in the air. We'll see if that works. Yeah, I feel the back going up. All right, now the back is up. You see we're misting up the window with the climate control. That's telling me things aren't quite right. Oh, here's another one. The 63, oh God, with the banging. $6,300 banging Olufsen system. Here's these little tweets which pop up off the top of the dash. Very cool stuff when they work. <laughs> At least we got one tweeter. Anyway, let's see if we've lifted up. Oh, yeah, so now we got all kinds of space in the wheel wells. Nice. So uh, that's the nice thing. I, I've mentioned that in other cars before. If you need to clear the body of a rival gang member that you just shot, you're backed into an alley and Oh, stop it! Beepings and warnings. You need to clear the alleys in front of you. It's the only way out. You lift up that suspension, you're going to be able to get over his head without causing a mess or dragging his body down the street. All right, yeah, we will refuel at some point. So anyway, there's your adaptive air suspension. Uh, you can press this to get into systems now. There's a parking system, background lighting, central locking. You can set up all your crap with this, even your wipers. You can't just have normal wipers. You have to be able to set them up with something and turn on the service position. Anyway, whatever. There it all is. You get into setup, but there's a whole different thing. Now you've got trailer towing mode and vehicle jack mode for the air suspension. So don't forget that or you're going to cause all kinds of mayhem. Let's get back into nav. Uh, here we've got some cup holders. 
And here we've got, uh, well, there's the lighter, which we were missing. And presumably this was some kind of an Audi phone you could have. These things work weird. You have to click them back. And if I open them, what are we going to get an iPod jack there? And nothing over there. And no good gun storage at all. You know, the phone takes it up down there. You're not going to fit shit in these things, so uh, you better have your guy with you who has his own armaments. The only thing you're going to fit him in is over there where the mask and that dry cleaning ticket are. The steering feels artificial in this car. You know, I'm sure it's variable assist or whatnot. Um, it reminds me of the electric steering in the Mercedes and the MLs and such of similar years. I don't think this car has electric steering where it's not really connected to the car. You know, you're just turning it and sensors are telling the car what to do. But it's done a great job of mimicking that. Uh, I'm sure it's going to stiffen up as we drive, which is fine. Um, but um, it is soulless and dead. Uh, very easy to turn, but it just has no vibe to it at all when you're moving at low speeds. Uh, they do want to make this car sportier than the S and the 7. That was their mission. So uh, it does have pretty impressive throttle response. It's not trying to give you the softest and gentlest launch. It's trying to let you feel like you're in some sort of a high-performance German sedan, which quite technically you are. But it drives nice. Look, I'm not going to lie. I mean, the car drives nice. When all the systems are working as they should, or when the car was brand new, um, man, what a way to cruise the Autobahn. This is nice, isn't it? The, the misty front. Um, but what a way to cruise the Autobahn. At a, I think it was limited to 130. It probably wasn't in Europe. But, um, you know, it's an incredible Q-ship bond burner. Uh, the problem is maintaining it as such. And I mean, let me emphasize this again. Man, if you're on a budget, I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're, you know, whoa, what's the fuel mileage? Is it going to cost me a lot at the pump or insurance? I mean, if you're worried about penny pinching, do not buy a 13 year old German luxury flagship. It's just not going to go well for you. You might be one of those guys who gets lucky, and that's great. You know, you drive it for a few years, change the oil, don't do any routine maintenance, sell it to the next guy with oil leaks and bad tires and brakes that need replacing, and that's fine. Uh, but if you're unlucky, you're going to have to put money in it just to keep it going, and uh, that's where it could become a major pain in the ass. And that isn't just Audi, mind you. I mean, that's obviously the same. Maybe even more so for a BMW 7 Series. And uh, depending on your luck with the Mercedes S-Class, really the same stuff. Eh, I mean, they give you a little bit of throttle noise inside. It's not uh, bone quiet. You get some V8 sound. Uh, and I think that thing's fairly quick. It's supposed to be sub 6, 0 to 60, like 5.9 or something, but it really doesn't immediately feel like it. I guess it puts you back in your seat a little bit. It's probably just that suspension that's really keeping you insulated from uh, having too much in the way of road fuel. Anyway, there it is. So here's a quick take on a 2008 Audi A8L. Uh, this one will be for sale. You can, I don't know if it'll be on our site, if we're keeping it, if um, uh, Andrew's gonna sell it himself, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, proceed at your own risk. If somebody asks me, is this a car I should buy? Uh, I'm gonna say no, probably not. You know, it comes with more liability than pretty much anybody really needs to have with a car, unless it's a function of love. I mean, if your whole purpose is just to look cool, forget it. There's more reliable ways of doing that. Uh, if you really do have a love for a big aluminum Q-ship Audi, then yeah, okay, fine. You know, then, then maybe it's worth it to you. And certainly if you have some disposable income where it's not going to bother you to maintain it, then uh, yeah, it might work. But, um, you know, if you're one of these guys that's worried about service costs, worried about gas mileage, thinking this car may be too unreliable for you thinking it may be too expensive to maintain, then you're probably right and you're better off looking in some other direction. And, uh, you know, I say that as a guy who likes these cars a lot, uh, but I do have some experience with them and I can tell you that, yeah, 
as often as not, you end up with a pretty expensive repair bill over something. So thank you very much for having a look today. Hopefully this was a much shorter, quicker video that's more accessible. And uh, we'll have some nice, big, good, long ones on other cars coming up. Uh, take care, and we will see you with the next one.